the Deputy Vice Chancellor, um, academics, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bulim and I can very good morning to you all. Um, I don't intend to make a long speech, but essentially to perhaps talk from a philosophical level uh, to the, as to the importance of uh, having research. Um, in fact, uh, just taking from a very practical perspective, you may have heard that in the budget that we announced, we've offered various incentives. Uh, for example, in um, one end, research and development. So there's various tax incentives if people engage in uh, research and development in the area of uh, renewable energy and in the ICT sector. So that's one end of the spectrum in terms of research and development. Of course, we've also offered, uh, for example, 10 PhD positions or scholarships uh, for those five from, from the civil service and five from outside the civil service. And again, we've offered a number of scholarships in the uh, space of masters. Now, this uh, essentially highlights the, the importance that we place on having uh, research done, critical analysis, and indeed uh, a lot more work to be done in terms of getting into the depth of various specific subject areas. If you look at uh, the civil service at the moment, there's very few people with PhDs in the civil service. There's very few people who have masters in civil service in specific specialized disciplines. And that obviously means that the level of perhaps input in terms of policy making, decision making, in terms of the input into policy making, in terms of having specialized um, uh, skill sets in specific areas, in terms of being able to pick up on the sort of growth that we have in the economy at the moment, nine years of growth. Um, but of course, many things can actually slow it down. And that is, of course, the, the lack of specialized personnel. So we need to have the right people at the right time, in the right places, in the right disciplines to sort of further that economic momentum, but more specifically into specific areas that, uh, that we require different skill sets in, whether it's marine science, whether it's forestry, uh, and other areas in terms of, say, uh, uh, clinical uh, psychology. Uh, we don't have enough actuarial. In fact, we don't even have a Fijian actuarial. Uh, we don't have, from the other end of the spectrum, from a medical science perspective, we don't even have a single Fijian cardio surgeon that's available in Fiji 24-7 that can carry out open heart surgery. So we have, uh, for example, if you join the public service and become a doctor, if you want to do postgraduate studies, we actually pay for you to do it at FNU, and it's limited to what FNU can offer. That's more what I call the practical uh, side of you know, research and practical side of, sort of developing specific skill sets. But from a greater philosophical perspective, I think research is very, very critical. And we can, of course, be limited in what we research, depending on our ability to open up our minds. And I think that is something that I'd like to specifically talk about. The fact that you have a symposium such as this now, and I'm grateful for ESP for organizing this, does actually go to show that we do not necessarily have a deep a culture of research. We do not have a deep culture of critical analysis. And many times we've actually, in, in the Fijian sort of, I can speak only from a Fijian perspective, I cannot speak about other Pacific Island countries, that in, in, in Fiji's case, many, much of the critical analysis is perhaps limited to perhaps socioeconomic imperatives, as opposed to having an open mind about what we can talk about, what we can research. And that is very critical. You know, I, I, I remember reading uh, one of my favorite sort of modern day philosophers, if you like, was Edward Said. Uh, Edward Said uh, gave a BBC, uh, I think it was John Reith lectures, BBC uh, radio lectures. And he call, he's called the lecture series the Representations of an Intellectual. And in that, he actually, and I urge you to read that, actually, it's only a very small book, I think it's about 97 pages. And in that, he actually talks about. Um, from an academic perspective, how an ac academic, to be truly independent, to be truly seen to have that level of mana uh, for people to take on your, the, your views, is for you to be able to maintain a particular level of independence. And of course, he talked about the trials and tribulations of modern day academics to be completely independent. Because as you know, that a lot of the uh, university organizations throughout the world are now funded by corporations maybe funded by different trusts, and their research and development is actually limited to who is actually funding your research and development. So in, in fact, it's a, it's a fantastic piece of work. And in that, I think it is very critically important for us to also ensure that when people do get out and do research, when they do talk about topics, 
um, they need to have that level of independence. They need to have that level of open-mindedness. Of course, you know, we, we, uh, we have, you know, when I was in, in, in various universities and writing up various theses or writing up various papers, you know, people used to always ask you, you know, are you sort of taking a Marxist perspective? Are you taking a libertarian perspective? Uh, you know, are you taking a cultural relative perspective? Uh, of course, you have all these isms, um, but today we have this sort of cacophony of isms, and a lot of people actually do talk about that. But I think the, the whole, the gist of what I'm trying to say is to be able to carry out research, you have to have an open mind about it. You cannot be beholden to any particular position even before you start your research. And I think that is very critical, and I, I'm afraid to say many academics in Fiji actually fall for that. They have a particular position, and they try and fit their research into that particular mindset. And, you know, in the same way, I've lamented on a number of occasions, um, pre- and post-budget, uh, about how we need people to carry out a critical analysis of the budget independently. We today, till today, we do not have single economists or accountants or legal persons who actually carry a particular level of credibility or mana, if you like, because that comes with independence, and is able to say, well, actually, this policy is good because of X, Y, Z from an economic perspective. Or this policy is good because, from a legal perspective, X, Y, Z. Nobody actually, firstly, has the um, gumption or audacity to do that. Nobody wants to put their name out there and say that, you know, I'm going to carry out a critical analysis of the budget. I'm using that just as an example. But everybody's kind of hiding behind a particular screen. Because at times, of course, and we found that, I mean, in, in my work since 2007 in government, at times people, you may make a particular decision that may affect, say, a group of business people in a negative manner because of a particular proposal they may put forward. But the next time when they put forward a proposal, you may actually say, well, this is good and we approve this. What is really interesting for, uh, for me was personally, they could not understand as to why we rejected it, the first proposal. Because the culture is that if this group of people, you say this is good policy or this is a good proposal and we, we accept it and we approve it, the next time you'll always do it because they are the same people. As opposed to what they're actually saying is the proposal. And I think that sort of level of Personalization, I think, is very much evident in Fiji. Analysis in Fiji is kind of beholden to personalization. It's also very much driven, and unfortunately, people have to actually accept this, that much of the analysis is also very ethnically driven, as we've seen. We have, we come from, we are post-colonial society. We have a, co uh, a colonial system that actually divided us along ethnic lines. Our schools were divided along ethnic lines indeed along religious lines at one point in time, but most definitely along ethnic lines. Even sports was divided along ethnic lines. So, you see, that is very much ingrained within the system. We can have this a big catharsis, and many people would argue that there is a big catharsis that took place post-2007, but whatever the case is, we need to be able to break down those walls that has actually been put up. Sometimes, unknowingly, you will actually fall into a particular way of thinking because of your conditioning. So I think for research, research requires you firstly to break down the walls within yourself. Break down the walls you set up within yourself, the compartmentalization that exists within your own brains. That is very critical. Because if you are able to break down the compartmentalization, then you can truly say that you are quite liberal in your thinking. And you're open to suggestions. You're open to new ideas. You're open to being actually being critical of what actually exists, or what existed previously and what exists now. Because after all, at the end of the day, the whole purpose of research, some may argue philosophically, you know, so altruistic uh, uh, goal of being finding the truth. Truth, of course, many can argue is subjective. But, uh, of course, many times you would argue that truth is, in fact, objective. But in the era of Trumpism, that's, there's a completely new dimension now. In the era of Trumpism combined with social media, there's a completely new perspective now. 
Uh, we have things like fake news. Uh, as I said in this uh, very room a few, uh, I think it was last year, <coughs> addressing a group of uh, young people, and I talked about social media. And that time I used an example, if I say, you know, that frog turned into a horse, people would say, when did it happen? <laughs> what color was the frog when it turned into a horse? As opposed to, can a frog actually turn into a horse? So you see, we, we are in this sort of uh, social media here, we are missing the point. So that in itself, the research itself now has become a new challenge to finding the actual truth itself. So when people are actually putting out ideas into the uh, open space, the social spaces, is part of the, you have perhaps an additional burden now, because you actually have to fight for the truth, for some very basic truths. Then you can get into the other space of, you know, more, more deeper truth, so to speak, more deeper research analysis. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, with those sort of few brief remarks, I wanted to say that research is, of course, very, very critical, is very, very important, a very, very practical perspective to develop the skill sets is very important, in, in fact, in terms of getting jobs, employment. Uh, we would argue that in certain um, uh, sections of the civil service, that level of critical analysis is missing. And we need that, and the only way we can have that is we actually have university students coming out as graduates who already have some of those skill sets ingrained in them. To be able to read a report and not simply regurgitate it, and I've seen it so many times, when you give a report and we ask them to do analysis of it, it's simply a summary of what's in the report, as opposed to being critically analytical about it. Criti being critically analytical does not mean negative, negativism. This simply means you have actually looked at all the different perspectives. In the same way that I say to most of the young lawyers uh, in the chambers, you know, you need to always think as a lawyer the various options that are there. You need to think about the logical conclusions of what's the logic of you saying X, Y, Z. You need to think three steps ahead. So from, from that perspective, of course, you know, from a very practical perspective, getting the research skills is very, very important from the job market. Uh, very important for us to be able to grow as an economy, to be able to create new jobs, that's also very critically important. It also creates a new level of transparency, because transparency is not simply that, you know, some amorphous concept. It's a very practical application of transparency. And that transparency includes being able to question things, being able to be critical about things, critical about current processes, about systems in itself. And thirdly, of course, by having research and development, we're able to develop new ways of thinking. We're able to ensure that we have a more enlightened society. And, and at the last level, of course, from a very practical perspective, there are new spaces that we are getting into. We have a population base that is 50% of the population is 27 years and younger. 70% of the population is below the age of 40. It's enormous. Some may argue challenges, but I think enormous opportunities. But you need to be able to get into that area of critical thinking, of research, etc., to be able to create opportunities for them. We need people who can be within the system to say, well, okay, all these people who are, you know, there's a, uh, or 40, who are 70% of the population, in about 30 years' time, a lot of people will be very old too. So how are we positioning ourselves? What are the policy measures we are putting in place? What's the impact on our society? What's the impact on our environment? All those issues are very, very critically important. So thank you once again uh, for the invitation. I wish you all the best for your two-day workshop. Binaka, thank you.